Alright, thank you so much, Miss Jackie. If you brought your Bibles, you can turn uh, to uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. Again, today we will talk about, uh, over the next few minutes, celebrating God's work and how that impacts our ability to accomplish His plan and the difference that that makes in the level of enthusiasm and, and drive that we have as we accomplish God's plan. And now, before we get to that, uh, we kind of have something to celebrate within the life of of our church. You see up there a picture of Cody Dar. Uh, he is not a new face uh, to probably any of you. If he is a new face, you'll want to get to know him and you'll have that opportunity uh, to do so in the coming weeks and months. But as I said, many of us are familiar with him. He has been in our church for a number of years. Uh, he, uh, we've ordained him to ministry. We've watched him practice uh, the skill set of ministry. And uh, Sunday evening, this past Sunday evening, during our business meeting, um, we voted as a church at the recommendation of the personnel team uh, to bring Cody on as a minister of pastoral care. Now, two key things I want you to catch about this role. One is he is doing this on a volunteer basis. So this does not impact um, our, our budget at all. Uh, he will be working uh, with myself and the other staff at about five to ten hours a week, just out of the generosity of our schedule. Now, what he will be doing is working to expand our existing ministry and what we can do now to provide care uh, for us as a church. Now, this does not uh, take uh, work off my plate or anyone else's plate. This is just helping us do a better job at what we're already trying to accomplish. He'll work in four key roles. One, he will, uh, he will continue to do a pulpit supply like he had begun doing over this past fall, and he and Brandon will share the responsibilities of, of preaching when I'm out on vacation or other church uh, responsibilities. He will um, take a, a kind of the leadership role of plotting the course of what we will learn and do on Wednesday evenings. Now, I'll still be one of the primary teachers, uh, but to where I was saying, Cody, this is what we need to do. Uh, tell me what you would more like to teach. I'm going to give him the opportunity to look at the spiritual needs of our church and say, okay, Tim, this is what I think uh, we need to learn about to accomplish God's plan. Here's some potential studies we can offer. How do you want to fit in? So I'll still be teaching, but he'll be the, the primary leader of the direction of our Wednesday nights. He will provide additional uh, visitation to what I already uh, accomplish and do. Uh, so that just increases the care we give. It doesn't mean I won't be around. I still will be uh, to, to minister to our, our membership. And he will, uh, he will expand our uh, ex existing missions efforts. Uh, and work with uh, leading and planning and executing an additional two to three uh, mission, local missions projects a year. Uh, things that, the you know, I look at my tenure and there were things I was always going, man, we need to do something about this or we need to reach out to that area. But, but the day I try to, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm plan this today, there'd be a, another major issue in the church that I would need to focus my attention on. So he is going to help us move in that direction. This is just a great opportunity for everyone involved. Uh, personnel was thrilled as I presented this idea, and it was kind of a, an easy decision uh, for us. Uh, the church on Sunday night, as we talked about it, everyone saw it as a first, first comment was, this is just a win-win. And uh, as I sat and talked about Cody, uh, once we had kind of the, the job description and were ready to move forward, you know, he just said, I don't, I don't know why I wouldn't do this. Uh, it's just a great situation. Now, he's in Florida today. Uh, you know, the, most of us don't start a new role by going on vacation. Uh, but, but he's doing that. Uh, but we had met, uh, we had lunch on, on Tuesday, and he's already beginning to work on on things, uh, planning and whatnot, uh, just a great thing. Uh, but wanted to go over th that. Uh, so while we were all together to make sure we were all on the same page as to what he will do um, and, and what he will help our church better accomplish. So that's just a little thing that just kind of in a cute way fits in with our theme of celebrating God's work. Again, uh, we will be looking through parts of Nehemiah chapter 8, and we'll highlight a few verses that will help us kind of put the whole story uh, together. But we will talk about the need to look at and reflect upon 
what God has done in our past and how that will help us accomplish His plan in the future. You know, I listen to, uh, to a lot of talk radio in the morning as I come down for work or as I, if I'm out running uh, errands or making visits in the morning. I'll have on, uh, I start with a, a, a local Kansas City sports broadcast and listen to them for a while later in the day. I may turn on more of a, a news or politically minded broadcast. But what I have found by listening to talk radio is in one way or another, every day is special. Because there we have come up with a reason to celebrate something on almost every day of the calendar. And it's gotten to be a little much. Now, I'm not talking about the big days. Uh, For sure, Christmas and and Easter need to be celebrated. And and Memorial Day and Veterans Day are all key times for us to, to honor different parts of our world on those days. But for instance, June 1st is National Donut Day. Now, I can kind of get on board with a good reason to go eat a donut for breakfast or for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just to make sure we celebrate the day well. Uh, June 1st is also Say Something Nice Day. So say something nice to the gal that sells you your donut. Uh, February 9th is National Pizza Day. Okay. Uh, January 8th is National Clean Off Your Desk Day. Uh, February 4th is Thank a Mail Carrier Day. Okay, that's reasonable. They, they do a good job. Uh, October 2nd is Name Your Car Day. So if you've not named your car, you have eight months or so, eight, nine months or so to get ready for naming your car. November 2nd is National Men Make Dinner Day. It's also National Devil Day Day. So some of you men, you, you need to start planning ahead and working on your deviled egg recipe for when you make dinner on November the 2nd. Some of you just need to make reservations because your wife wants your house to still be intact after November 2nd. But it's like every day special. We're never going to have just an ordinary Tuesday anymore. And I'm kind of a grouchy old man stuck in a young man's body. So every morning when I hear it's, it's such and such day, I go, this is just ridiculous. Not every day can be special. But what I'll also say in regards to Christians in the church is sometimes we need to take a cue from this part of our world because sometimes we are lousy celebrators. Man, sometimes as Christians, we experience God do incredible things in our lives and on our behalf. And sometimes as churches... God does a tremendous work, and we barely stop to say thank you. Man, we just move right through that blessing, and we're on to the next thing. And in, in terms of, of moving towards God's plan for our life and for our church, we have to stop and celebrate. One, because God deserves it. He absolutely deserves to be celebrated and honored. And when He does something on our behalf, we should not walk by that so quickly. Secondly, it's those times of celebration that provide the grit to keep moving forward with accomplishing what God has planned for our lives. So today we talk about this because I believe that celebrating is as crucial to overcoming opposition, talked about last week, if we're going to accomplish what God has planned for our life and for our church. So let's look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8 uh, recently, or just a bit ago rather. I read the first three verses of the chapter. And the first principle I want us to all take to heart today is that to celebrate God's work, we need to remember His previous accomplishments. If we're going to be good celebrators, or if we're going to become better celebrators, we need to develop the habit of remembering God's previous accomplishments. It's a crucial part of making this part of our rhythm in our lives. Now, the, the passage opens by saying that all the people were gathered together at the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to read the book of the law. So we have a new character introduced. Now Ezra, he has his own book. He was a big deal in the life of the Israelites, and his book is right before Nehemiah. Now there are some scholars that think they were intended to, uh, to be one book, 
that just told different aspects of the same story, I think it works just fine to have them as two. But they had parallel ministries. Their ministries overlapped. They were serving Israel at the same time. So it is somewhat curious that their books don't reference each other that much. For whatever reason, they just don't. But, but today, the story we look at is one instance to where the book of Nehemiah also talks about the ministry of Ezra. Now again, at the same time, they are serving Israel in different capacities. Nehemiah, as we've learned and discovered, he was more of an administrative leader. He was going to be the project manager for seeing the walls rebuilt around the city. Ezra serves more of a spiritual priestly figure. He's going to be the, the face and the voice of God into the life of the Israelites. Now, while Nehemiah was still a representation of God's leadership, they just functioned differently. And God had designed them with a different skill set and had given them a different task to serve the Israelites. Ezra comes into the story today because he is going to, after everything Israel has seen God do, and the rebuilding of the walls, after everything the city of Jerusalem has experienced, Ezra's going to come in and lead them in time of reflection and celebration and thanking God for what he has done on their behalf. Now, in those first three verses, there were a couple major things that happened as Ezra led this time of celebration. One thing we have to look at, just in those first three verses that we recognize, is that a lot of preparation went into this event. Ezra's getting ready to lead them uh, in a day of honoring God for what he did. But it was not willy-nilly. They didn't go by the seat of their pants to accomplish this. No, a lot of work went into seeing this day and this time accomplished. They are at uh, the, the water gate. Which, uh, which was a gate within the walls. It was a, a built structure that it, it was noted as the, the water gate because it would have given them access to the, the Gihon Spring. So in that part of the city, when you went out that gate, that's where you accessed water. And that's where they were going to meet on that day. So to, to arrange this meeting, they built a special platform, they built a special podium, so Ezra would be able to adequately lead them. And so he, he's up above the crowd a bit, and he has a place to set uh, uh, the scroll that he will be reading from, much like I've got my Bible and my notes right there. They put in a lot of effort to make this day happen. Sometimes it takes some work to honor God well, and we must be willing to do the, uh, the extra effort. They are in a public arena and not the temple. Right? They didn't go to the, the, the religious building or, or the, the area that God had led the construction of to honor Him. They went to a place in more the market area. Likely because there wasn't going to be enough room in the temple. Temple wasn't going to house them. There were going to be far too many Jews that came in to celebrate uh, with under Ezra's uh, leadership that day. Far too many people to where the temple just wasn't going to fit them all. So they met in a place that would. Now, of course, when you meet in a place that's not set up for a service like this, that's some part of the reason why they had to go to that extra effort in building the uh, the structure for Ezra to stand on that he would lead from. Another part of significance there is Ezra takes the word of God with him. Typically in that day, uh, the, the word of God was on a scroll. It was not in a bound book like, like it has, has been for many years, but it's just on a scroll that had to be rolled and unrolled, and uh, it was very rare to have one. The, uh, now, we all need to treat God's Word with honor and respect. We shouldn't just flip our Bibles around, not because it's mystical, because it's God's Word. So we need to treat it well. We need to treat it with respect, both literally and figuratively. Uh, the unique part is that at this time, instead of the Word of God being only in the temple, it's going to be out in the marketplace. Now, that's something that we don't always catch the, the intrigue of or, or the significance of, because we can take our Bibles anywhere. We live in a country to where you can walk down any road with the Word of God in your hand 
and it is no big deal. It's accepted by the culture. No one's going to probably harass or hassle you. Uh, For sure, no authority figure can stop that. But God's Word is readily accessible today. Many of you brought your Bibles. Uh, I've got a Bible. If I would have forgotten that one, I had a couple extra on the shelf. I also have a phone that I can pull open an app on a tablet or, or like you, open 50 different versions of the Scripture. They're going to hear from God's Word today. And that was not readily accessible. It was a special thing in their lives. We don't want to miss that. They are gathering in a place to hear God's Word. An incredible thing that happened that day. Third thing is the Jews made a tremendous effort to attend this time of reflection. Jews came from far and wide to be there as the word that the, uh, no, no doubt when we think towards what prompted Nehemiah when, when the walls were destroyed, that word spread. I mean, bad news can travel awful fast. So the word got out that the city was in disrepair, but no doubt when the walls got rebuilt, that word spread too. And there is a, a sense of excitement that is going on, and Jews came from far and wide to attend this day of celebration. Travel was tough back then. To get to church today, I stood in my hallway, I started my truck from a keypad, I walked from my house to a perfectly warm vehicle, and I drove 10 minutes south. It's pretty easy to get to church today. In fact, most of us wouldn't travel much further than 30 minutes to attend the church of our choice. We'd find some place quicker. Or closer by. And I'm not saying any of that's bad. I'm not saying we should make it hard to get to church. I just want us to catch the significance that when it says the Jews came from far and wide, that was not an easy process. This was a big deal to them, and they were willing to go through some difficulty to be there firsthand and participate in celebrating God's previous accomplishments. The men and women were there, meaning that, that all people got involved. And that Ezra read from early in the morning till midday. That is at least from 8 to noon. Possibly longer. Just hard to tell based on the way the text was really written. I mean, they sure didn't put it in our terms as you know 7 a.m. to noon. But it is very likely the, the minimum of that time span would have been for four hours. It takes a lot of work to stand up and listen to someone talk for four hours. You have to really be engaged in what that individual has to say. But that's where their hearts are at. They would, would for a minimum of four hours, stand there so that they can, as a group, celebrate God's previous accomplishments. As we read from the book of Moses... Now, if you flip through your Old Testament, you go, and Moses doesn't have a book named after him. Well, you're right. Uh, but, but we attribute, I say we, scholarship, Old Testament studies, we attribute the, first fi- the writing of the first five books to be to Moses. Uh, of course, there's some that disagree with that. I just call them wrong. Uh, most conservative scholars that would line up with our thought pattern would say Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. And that would have been the, the words that, that Ezra would have been reading from. So, portions of that book. Now, obviously, he didn't get through all five books the first day. But he, he kind of probably did a highlight reel of celebrating what God had done. And in the first five books, we see everything from creation to mankind messing up. But we also see uh, the key feature of those first five books is the covenant or the relationship that God established with mankind. How he laid out the framework with how he was going to relate to the the people that lived in that time and to the Jews who he formed that relationship with. And that is likely what Ezra would have been reading through, is reminding them of the way that God had cared for them over the many years of, of their relating. Reminding them of, of all the things he had done. The fire by night, the cloud as they were freed from slavery, the, the develop, all those great stories in those books. All the things God did is likely what Ezra would have been reading. 
And that would have been a very encouraging time as they stood there, looked at their freshly rebuilt walls and just thought over the decades and years that had passed and all that God had done. And think about it. This group of people had been through a roller coaster of events and emotions. Their walls and their city and the protection and prestige had all been destroyed. It was gone. And that would have been fearful if you lived in the city, but it would have been emotionally troubling as a Jew to know that the city that represented the city of your faith no longer had the prestige that it once had. The walls are rebuilt. Incredible moment. But in that process, they faced opposition from without. They faced internal fatigue as they just got worn down from the project. If you read through parts of Nehemiah, he's got to go in and straighten up issues on how the Jews related to each other, on, on wealth issues and how the rich treated the poor. So many things have happened. But there they are today to celebrate God's work. And not just what he had done in rebuilding the walls, but Ezra is going to direct their attention to everything he had done in their past. And as believers today, sometimes we just need to stop. Sometimes we just need to grab a seat on our couch and think for a while on everything that God has done on our behalf. When we get worn down at trying to make spiritual progress, sometimes we just got to look back and see how far we've come and all the things that God has done to make that happen. It will provide the grit we need to move forward. If we are going to become better celebrators or begin to celebrate God's work at all, we begin by remembering His previous accomplishments. Second principle from this passage I want us to look at is we need to affirm God's past blessings. Now, there's a distinct, somewhat of a distinction between His work and His blessings because there's sometimes God's works, and it doesn't feel like a blessing at the time feels hard. God's also a God that disciplines His children or will discipline a church to get them right back on path. That's the work of God. Today, we're going to, or for this verse and this point, we just think about the way God has blessed us. The generosity or the gifts He has given to us. In chapter, chapter 8, verse 6, He says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the, uh, the Lord with their faces to the ground. We're also going to take a step from simply remembering what God has done to channeling that through a heart of gratitude and a heart that wants to thank God for everything he has done. We've skipped just a few verses in the story from when Ezra started reading from the book of the law. But what we will see is as this time maybe begin to wind down, or as there was going to be a shift, Ezra pronounces a word of blessing or a word of thanks upon all that God had done. He is going to, on his own, but also lead the children of Israel in a word of thanks to God. Yeah, they just remembered everything he's done. Now they're going to say thank you for that. And make sure that God hears from them how grateful they are for what He has done and accomplished and the way He has been good to them. And that's an important step to make, to go from simply thinking about it and, and reflecting upon what has, God has done to making sure we thank Him for what He has done. Now remember, when they hear this word of blessing, they've been standing there for hours. Not sitting, standing. Standing. We don't know what the weather was like. It could have been hot. It could have been cold. Probably wasn't perfect. They probably already, many of them have done a lot of hard travel to get there. So they would have likely come physically fatigued from all the effort and energy they expended just to arrive. And now they have been there for over four, at least four hours, if not more, hearing Ezra read from the Word of God. And now he goes into a word of blessing. And they, they heartily and enthusiastically agree 
and go into a time of, of worship over what God had done. See, their effort didn't stop when they quit reflecting upon what had got, God had done. They knew there was a second phase to that. They knew that once they had remembered and once their attention had been drawn to God's previous work, they had a t- to translate that into a real-time affirmation of God and all He had done. And after four hours, probably their minds are mush. But God had their hearts, and they transferred that to a heart of worship and a heart of affirmation. We need to make sure we make that step as well. And make sure that when we say thank you, our hearts are really in it. We've all issued a a kind of a pitiful apology. I'm sorry. Sometimes we issue some pitiful thanksgiving to God. And He deserves more than that. He absolutely deserves more than, oh yeah, thanks, you, you, you stepped in when I thought the bottom was going to drop out and made it all better and, and, and I'm moving right along. No, He deserves an enthusiastic affirmation of His work in our lives. When we read the examples of the Jews and what they had done after Ezra had read to them for hours after their attention had been captured on all that God had done. When Ezra blessed the Lord, the people answered, Amen and Amen, lifting up their hands. They bowed their heads and they worshipped the Lord with their face to the ground. They did everything to associate and to to show God that they were highly intentional with thanking Him for for His work on their behalf. We need to make sure that we truly affirm God and thank God for His work in our lives. That's a crucial step we must make. So we're going to do this real practically here in just a bit, but if you're taking notes, I want you to stop and write on your note page something God has done for you this past week. And make it very specific. If I was sitting there, it would be easy for me to write my children or my wife, which are all great things. But, but take a moment and think of something that you experienced God do this past week. Write that on your, your little note page real quick. All right, keep that. We'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Third truth from today uh, that we need to incorporate is if we're, if we're going to become better celebrators of what God has done, we need to become very intentional about celebration. Not something we just want to do every so often or do when it's convenient. It's something that we want to do on purpose as part of how we honor God and as part of how we aim to accomplish His plan in our lives going to pick up and read a few verses beginning in 13. Uh, where it reads, On the second day the hands of Father's house of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written... In the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof, and in their courts, and in the courts of the, of the house of God, and in the square of the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim, and all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in the booths, for from the day of Joshua, the son of Nun, on that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was great rejoicing. 
And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. To the rule. So, as part of how they are going to celebrate God's work, they are going to move into a time of celebrating an established feast or festival that God had ordained in Israel's history. As you look towards the Old Testament, you really study the the details of God's covenant with them and how they were going to relate. Man, that law was tedious. That was a difficult relationship to maintain because there were a lot of do's and don'ts that those, those Jews had to try to keep up with. That's why the cross is so important because we're not tied to that law anymore because God has fulfilled that covenant through the death of His Son. But one thing in the midst of of all those rules and regulations that had to be followed, one thing that was there was a, a series of feasts and festivals that had been set up as times of reflection upon what God had done. And these were very beneficial times within the spiritual life and development of the Israelites. Because as they celebrated them, it would have been impossible not to think about what God had done. Because you didn't celebrate a festival that had key spiritual significance and go through that time like it was another day. No, it was a time of intentional reflection and affirmation of what God had done in the life of the Israelites. And this was a very powerful time in the life of Israel. It's something that that God did not carry over into the new covenant. But there's an example there that we need to follow in our lives. As we watch this story unfold, many of the people that have traveled in, that came from far and wide, have went back home. So on the first day, they all gather, they hear Ezra read from the Word of God, they have a time of worship and affirmation, and then they need to return because it is harvest time, and there is a lot of work to be done. And harvest, many of you that grew up in agricultural towns, you you realize harvest is not something you put off. Uh, We can put off catching them up on paperwork and, and still go about our routine, Other jobs, you can delay a day and do what you want. But when those crops are ready to come in, those farmers are pretty focused on getting those crops in. So the Israelites that needed to return to agriculture, they would come for a day, but when the time of celebration is over, they're going home. But what we see is some of the uh, Jewish officials stayed with Ezra to celebrate, or to, I'm sorry, to further study the book of the law, and as they do that, they are reminded of the Feast of Booths, or the Festival of Booths. It was established to help them remember how when the Israelites exited slavery and lived in the wilderness, God still took care of their physical need and their need for housing and and lodging. And it was a marker in their minds that affirmed, God will take care of you and provide for your needs if you are seeking to honor Him with your lives. So when they are reminded of this, they put into place a a renewal of this celebration of this festival. And they begin to circulate the word that it's time to celebrate the festival of booths. What that entailed is that uh, many of the Jews that lived within the city limits of Jerusalem built temporary housing structures uh, on the rooftop. Those days they had flat roofs. And so they built a, uh, a structure of various leaves and branches that they would stay in for a period of seven days. Now again, many Jews came into Jerusalem for this time of celebration. So they, uh, many of them would return and build structures outside of, uh, many of them outside of the same gate that they stood at to hear Ezra preach from the law of Moses. But they are all going to once again make every effort to celebrate God's work, so much so that uh, the text, as we read about Joshua, what they're saying is, is, is in this time, when Ezra is leading them in this time of celebration, they did it with so much gusto and effort that it had the, the festival of, booth, of booths 
had not been conducted with that amount of excellence and, and drive since the leadership of Joshua. So it had been a long time since the Festival of Booths had been made a big deal. And it had been a while since that celebration was really used to draw Israel's attention back to all that God had accomplished uh, through them. But underneath Ezra's leadership, they're going to get it right this time. And the significance and why I talk about these festivals, and there were a number of them that uh, were celebrated, and there's a number of them that modern Jews still celebrate today. The, the importance of them is that they drew attention back to God's work. And they were intentional about it, because it was on the calendar, and they made the preparations, they put forth the effort, and they got themselves ready to celebrate that festival because it was a significant marker of what God had accomplished. And in our own lives, we have to develop some sort of rhythm, both as individuals and a church, to where we become highly intentional about celebrating God's work. That there are times in the year that we are going to stop and thank God for what He has done and the way He has worked. Now this can be done in a number of different ways. I once heard a story... Uh, about a pastor with a, a young family, probably when this was happening, he was probably in a similar phase of life that I am in now. And uh, in their yard, they had a blessing bench. So outside they had a, nothing special or, or classy about it, just, just a park bench, uh, something they probably bought down at the Lowe's or Home Depot. And he said, once a week I would take my boys out and we would sit on that bench for just a little bit, and just thank God for what He had done in our lives that week, or before that. But they put it on the calendar. They said, this is when we're going to thank God for what He's done in our lives, and this is where we're going to do it, and this is how we're going to do it. Very powerful thing He had done. I, uh, I, I know people that celebrate spiritual birthdays, and that when they identify this is when... Um, so if we were, we don't do this in my family, we talk about it, but I know families that will buy a birthday cake. And so since I accepted Christ on June the, uh, July the 7th, many years ago, on July the 7th, we would celebrate and I would tell the story of how I came to Christ. Now again, not every family has to do that, but we need to do something that draws our attention back to our relationship with Christ and what He has done. We need to, to, in a sense, force ourselves to remember the work of God in our lives and make sure we give Him the enthusiastic thank you that He deserves. Now, we do this in some way as a church. Uh, a few Wednesday nights ago, we gathered for our, our annual church kickoff where we highlight what had God had done in the previous year, and then we look forward to, I spend just a, a couple of minutes looking forward to what God may want to do through our ministry this coming year. And if we're going to accomplish that, I may speak a few moments about what we're going to need to do to get there. And it's a great evening. It's one of my favorite, e favorite days on our church calendars when we get together and celebrate what God has done. But I also know since then, since we had that, a few weeks ago, we've had uh, a gal join our church. We've scheduled a baptism, and we brought Cody on. So in just a few short weeks, God's already done some incredible things in the life of our church. We need to make sure we don't wait till next January to play catch-up and celebrating God's work in the life of our church. And in my own life, I need to make sure that God hears from me more than once a year all the reasons I'm thankful for what He has done. This is important, important stuff, and we don't want to miss this. Again, there are some things that are produced when we become very good celebrators. It produces the confidence for us to move forward in accomplishing God's plan because we recognize if God has worked then, He can still work now. It produces the motivation. We see God is very active and I've got to keep moving forward. It produces the resilience we need because serving God can be very difficult work. Personally and as a church, it gets tough. 
But when we focus and thank God for what He's already done, it helps us continue to move forward in accomplishing what He wants to achieve in our future. Celebrating is a crucial part of accomplishing God's plan for our life and our church. We need to make sure we are doing a good job at this task. One, God deserves to hear our thanks and praise. Two, it's going to keep us moving forward at accomplishing His plan. In just a moment, Miss Jackie and Miss Carol will come and they will lead us as we begin to wrap up our service. Again, I said we were going to do this very practically today. When Miss Jackie begins to sing, before you join in, I want you to look at the, whatever you wrote down that God had done in this previous week. And I want you to stop, and I want you to thank God for it. Now, you may have already thanked God for that. Do it again. He doesn't mind hearing thank you twice. But we're going to use these next few moments to get us moving in that direction or to keep us developing that habit. Let me pray for us, and then we'll uh, enter into our time of reflection. God, we thank you so much for today and for what you're doing in our lives and our church. God, I thank you that... Probably many of us or all of us could have sat there and uh, wrote down a lot of things that you're doing for us and a lot of ways that you're uh, moving in our lives and in our church. And, and God, I thank you for that. Um, as, uh, as we stop to uh, draw our attention to just one thing you did, may these next few moments uh, be a time of motivation and may they help us to better establish the discipline of thanking you for the work you've accomplished in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you all please stand?